Hello, I'm Captain Mark Purcell. I'm here today with Admiral James Bond Stockdale, as well as students and staff of the Command Leadership School, to discuss with Admiral Stockdale his unique insights and compelling personal experiences from a time he likes to call my 10-year campaign in Vietnam. It's a very great pleasure to have Admiral Stockdale here with us today, and I know we're all looking forward to his remarks. Admiral Stockdale, I'd like to start the questions today, perhaps with the most obvious area for discussion. That's uh, to talk about your time as a POW in Vietnam. Uh, specifically, it seems nearly inconceivable for many of us to, to, to the length of time, eight years in the POW camp. What did you rely on? What was it that you felt kept you going during that time frame? Well, when you ask me what kept me going, I, I have to admit that I don't think I would have made it if it hadn't been for my comrades in there. And I think we all feel that way. We, we were often in solitary, but we had a communication system that we had uh, manufactured practically. And, and there was some touch with, your, with a human being that hostile. So uh, I, uh, I, I have to give first place in my survival to uh, the many people that took risks communicating with me, and I with them. Uh, there was this another, another factor uh, that applied to us older guys in prison. I mean by that, people that were shot down after their 40 or the nearabouts. I was over 40. Uh, that meant you were born, I was born in 1923, that meant you were born in the early 20s. And that meant if you were a military aviator, you probably had your wings by 1950, and uh, you were a, a, a junior officer. And when the Korean War was fought, now that was a terrible, uh, place to spend the winter, uh, and it was uh, a cold, um, like Vietnam, uh, sometimes misunderstood war. And I know a lot of people that did tremendous work as, as, as uh, fighters and prisoners over there, and I know them personally. But there, was, uh, there were some factors about the prisoners of Korea that uh, really got the attention of people like me. And I think most of this was played up by the press to be a bum rap to the many good men that were in prison. But there was a, a, a series of articles that came out, uh, one of them from the New Yorker magazine that resulted in a book uh, being uh, d developed out of it. And it was called In Every War But One. And I'll bet you that I know the people that were my age read that with horror in their, their minds as uh, it talked about, what this book seemed to say was that it was ever by self once you got captured. Now that's, a, that's not the way it was, I'm sure, but nevertheless, I, there are documentations of confused and young soldiers, cold, in cramped quarters in the winter, and some of their numbers sometimes older guys would throw them out in the snow to die. Uh, that's the worst case. Uh, there were others of uh, uh, enough that made a lot of press. And this was what, uh, and you, you will remember that 25 Americans refused to come home after that war. They, they were just defected to China or North uh, Korea. And the, uh, this prompted uh, General Eisenhower, who was about to run for president, to do several things. And he did them promptly, came in office. There was no code of conduct. And he, uh, he, he appointed a panel, drafted the code of conduct, and with the prison in particular in mind. And then he started these survival schools we all went through. Uh, that uh, were for high-risk people, particularly pilots that flew over enemy territory, and uh, many SEALs undergo that, and there are other people. But they spend uh, two weeks in a, in a, a rough-and-tumble situation. They, uh, in my day, and I went through that two-week course twice at my request, 
they permitted people posing as enemies that would be in the in mock prisons uh, they would be in uniforms uh, that's something like communist uniforms and in my day there were usually Korean War enlisted men who volunteered this work and when they did it they had permission to sock officers not not harshly but I mean they could <laughs> knock you down and that was real and that was a, and so uh, all of this started but when we were coming up and we were going through these survival schools, the message got through to many of us that this prison was a reality and for God's sake, we've got to do right when we get in there. I mean, you know, it was just part of it. And so it was, you know, there's so many expressions that go with people in prisons. They're sitting out the war or they're, uh, what are they doing in their cells? It means loafing in their cells. There's a more descriptive word and as though you kind of think that they took the easy route to just slide off and, and uh, stand on the sidelines. In this, this war and in the Korean War, there was plenty of action right there uh, in the prison to uh, make you uh, proud of the day if you got through it. And uh, so we all had this burning drive in our hearts. I, I'm only talking about a few people but they were those that I was closely associated with that we weren't this this was not a sideline operation this is where you really did your most important work and whatever you did in there was going to be uh, remembered after you were dead so that uh, was a motivator it's kind of a I've said it in kind of an awkward way but this is no joke if you, if you don't hold up your end, if you don't act as an honorable prisoner, you're going to be ashamed of yourself for life. And we felt that way. And uh, that was just a generational uh, thing that uh, I don't, ex you know, it was just a fluke. But what became the leadership of the prison were all guys that took this as the core of your career. So th th those are two things that kept us going. Sure. Admiral, you mentioned that uh, President Eisenhower worked on the Code of Conduct, and I believe you said earlier that uh, there were some people uh, during the early days of Vietnam who said maybe this is a, a limited engagement oh, yeah, and, and that, perhaps the Code of Conduct shouldn't apply. Uh, that's, uh, that was a result of uh, none of this talk like that came from anybody that was in prison. But as we were uh, making, I was uh, made three uh, cruises to uh, uh, Vietnam and the wartime era. Uh, the third one, I was a wing commander. And uh, I had uh, received uh, a mail from people I'd known that had retired from the Navy. And they talked about how th they knew I was going into combat as a CAG for the, uh, yet another and, and you know, it, uh, more than one person said, I think of the uh, Code of Conduct as a total war uh, document. This is a limited war. We're told daily in television this is a limited war. So please don't uh, take yourself too seriously on that Code of Conduct in a limited war. And uh, this was also talked about in some quarters among aviators uh, abo uh, aboard ship. Uh, not on the ship I was on, but uh, I, I, I talk as we were nearing the uh, Vietnam coast to all my air group, which included over 100 aviators. And uh, I talked about uh, if you're going, if you believe that you can go over here and do what we're going to be asked to do and, and somehow m m meter yourself with less than full enthusiasm for what you're, the prosecution of your duties while airborne, the time to turn in your wings is now, not when you get over there. I said, that when we have a limited war, we know what's limited. This is common sense. Our weapons, are, 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 uh, tactics are limited, uh, our uh, uh, geographic location is possibly limited. There are all of these things that we call a limited war. 
But anybody that thinks he can take all of this material and somehow apply only that percentage of his instincts and strengths in a battle is doesn't is contradicting human nature. You're going to get, if you don't go in there, you've got to throw everything into that when the engagement starts. And if anybody here doesn't believe that, then I would like to talk to you after this uh, speech is over because I don't want people out there in this frame of mind flying with my aviators. And uh, so that's where I come down on that. You cannot, there's no such thing as a limited war for an individual in combat. Admiral, you did a lot to prepare your and your squadron in innovations. Could you care to speak on any of those innovations that provided? Uh, well, the I'll, I'll, I left. Uh, I, my biggest innovation was between the first and second cruises, and that was when well, I was flying F-8U uh, Crusaders, and that was the Navy's first supersonic truly supersonic airplane. I mean, you could go at five uh, handily. And uh, as planes age, it's normal in, uh, to expect them to uh, take on more and more capabilities as time wears on. And one of the things that usually happens to fast jets is that someday you're going to start hanging heavy rockets on them and you're going to maybe uh, hanging bombs on them. And this was a uh, this became a kind of a there was a cult that uh, grew up in the F-8 community that said over our dead body this is the first time we've had the top airplane in the world and so we're not going to dirty it up and and ruin this uh, uh, chance to become the leading aces of the war and the, and I saw that what was going on down there and I said if you're going to get in this war uh, when when the American Navy wasn't in it yet of course. But we'd had a few people over there as advisors flying AD aircraft and things like that. I said, you're going to have to make this squadron air to ground capable. And I'm going to do it. But I'm not going to honk my horn. I'm going to do it surreptitiously. It was, nobody had a training syllabus set up to, the supply system had rocket rails and bomb racks for F-8s. But nobody was drawing them. And nobody uh, apparently had the guts to say, get over there and get them on the planes and get ready to use them. I secretly got one of my good officers who had flown jets in Korea to pick a team of us and draw equipment for about six airplanes while we took a, a summer cruise to Hawaii. I left that group ashore and I said, make yourselves air to ground capable and when we come back, you six teach us how to do it. And we all did that. And uh, we were the only squadron in the world, that had, uh, F-8 squadron, that had, had this capability. And we weren't honking our horns. But as we neared Pearl Harbor for the over operational readiness inspection, I, I entered us, not only in the air-to-ground competition, but in the air-to-air -air competition. And, uh, and that, that had fallout. Uh, we scored well. Uh, they shotgunned the report to a lot of leaders including the commander of the 7th Fleet, later my good friend Tom Moore. And as uh, soon as we got to the 7th Fleet area, uh, it, it so happened that some F-8 photo planes got shot down in Laos and they wanted to escort those that were going to be taking pictures thereafter. And I first slept on the ship in 7th Fleet waters. I was awakened at midnight and Tom Moore had gotten the message that said we were to air ground capable. And that was the only plane he could put up there that could keep up with the F-8 photos. They also could go 600 knots indicated at treetop level. And so we were transferred to the carrier constellation from our carrier the first day we went to work. That gave us a lot of experience, two months on, uh, nearly two months on the Connie, and uh, that was a good improvisation. When I was the CAG the last time out, uh, we were doing, the war started. The war started on my second cruise, and I started it. I'll get to that later. <laughs> At least I led the first strike into North <laughs> Vietnam. But uh, 
the, uh, in the third cruise, we were bombing uh, bridges a lot, and the Th uh, Thanwa Bridge was our, our nemesis. It was overbuilt by the Chinese as their first big engineering project. And the, we had a, a, a Marine fighter squadron with me, uh, an F-8 squadron. And uh, the uh, XO of the squadron, a, a great pilot, a former Blue Angel, uh, came up to me and he said, you know, we're, we're wasting pilots and wasting time over here on this bridge. He said, those 500-pound bombers are just ricocheting off the girders. And he was right. He said, I'm low. And I found that uh, the uh, biggest bomb we got on here is 2,000 pounds. And I figured out a way I can drop 2,000-pound bombs from this F-8. I want to see what you think of it. And I said, we went through it, and he told me all about it. And I said, I'll go. I'll talk to the captain. And, uh, and uh, Bart Connolly, the captain, who was uh, very ready to support any improvement of uh, our uh, fighting skills, said, well, try it out. See how it works. So we, we, we did, and it worked. Uh, we had to download a lot because we'd be overweight on the cats. So that was the b second biggest improvisation. And we had air-to-ground capability with 2,000, we'd each carry or under each wing a 2,000-pound bomb plus other armament. Uh, I, after I was, I, I've been reading uh, ever since I was shot down and got home, uh, things that happened to my contemporaries in the, in the years following my shoot down. And I read just an account the other day of how that same squadron, the F-51, went on a strike about two years after I was shot down, where two F-8s, with each carrying two 2,000-pound bombs with influence fuses, were able to provide flak suppression for uh, 16 A-4s that were going after targets. And the way they would do that, they would come in low, and then they would horse it up to about 11,000 feet, and then they could float down and have a look at the bridge area and see where the heavy guns were. Now the A-4s are behind them and following them. And, and, as, and then we would take it down to a, a, a 4,000 feet and then and pickle them off right over these heavy guns and they were set to explode at 1,000 feet. And uh, it's a miraculous use of this thing. I never had that kind of improvisational ability, but at least I pulled the string on the first, in the first case. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Admiral, you indicated that uh, <laughs> you led the first strike into, uh, into the north, yeah. uh, but I understand you were also uh, there at the beginning incidents in the Gulf of Tonkin. From your experience, uh, what were some of those sequence of events? Well, it all happened in one week. It was the first week of August. And uh, there were three air, major air actions, and I led all three of them. When this F-8 that had just come back from Laos, and, and this squadron of people that were uh, air to ground capable. Uh, uh, the first, uh, I, I was, uh, it was Sunday, August 2nd, and it was going to be a lazy day at sea. There was only one flight. I was going to fly it in the mid afternoon, early afternoon. And there was an announcement to all, uh, uh, they closed the door, and all the pilots in the ship uh, were called into this room, and they said, there's something called a DeSoto patrol that's being conducted at this time. And a DeSoto patrol is uh, the transit uh, along the coast of uh, Nam, uh, approximately uh, uh, 12 miles or, or so offshore, making uh, certain observations as they proceed. And uh, so just be cognizant. When I say DeSoto Patrol, you'll know there's a destroyer and he's offshore in Vietnam. And uh, we were in the middle of this flight, which I, I took, undertook uh, mainly to train my uh, wingman, who was a brand new pilot in the squadron. And we uh, were just at the uh, halfway point or so when I got a call from the ship to switch to strike control. That meant switch my radio to the frequency that's used for planes that are in transit to a target. And uh, I did so and found out that the Maddox was uh, under threat of immediate attack. Their location was 300 miles north of us, and we went the, the four F-8s. They landed the A-4s. I never understood why, because <laughs> we could have used them up there. But we went up there, and uh, we again, we were too low on fuel to use our burners on, at this time. 
But in military, we went up 300 miles in 30 minutes was a piece of cake. And uh, we got there just as the uh, torpedo boats had completed their, un, uh, their unsuccessful torpedo drops, thank God. And the Maddox was turning south, and we were, uh, we were to uh, destroy the boats if we could. Low on fuel that we were. But anyway, we, all, we certainly shot them up. And uh, we, I thought at least one of them was not going to make it home. And uh, so that was event one. That was a, what we considered to be an unprovoked attack on a destroyer in international waters by four armed torpedo boats. Uh, everybody was kind of all, uh, uneasy then. There was a lot of meetings aboard ships of p people from different carriers over and confer with their wing commanders and so forth. And, uh, and we, would, we were flying, uh, usually keeping an eye on that Maddox. That was, uh, we didn't patrol over it, but I want, everybody wanted to know where they were and how's he doing. And uh, on, the, on, on Tuesday, uh, the Sunday being the, f the first uh, go, on Tuesday I had a late dusk hop and I was coming back and uh, the, uh, I landed about sunset. I went uh, to the flight gear in my flight suit to have supper. And the, uh, they said there were a couple of intercepts this afternoon. An intercept is a name for a message that the United States Intelligence Service receives and translates from a, a provocative state. Uh, in other words, an intercepted North Vietnamese message. But neither one of these sounded particularly provocative. Uh, and this is just table talk. They said the first one, they just called out the numbers of the uh, Maddox and the Turner Joy. After attack on Sunday, the Maddox went down to the <clears throat> bottom of the, uh, the uh, operating area mm -hmm. and they assigned a, another destroyer, Turner Joy, to go north with him. So they were a pair and they were identified. Well, big deal, they're 12 miles off. You can see them with binoculars and read their numbers. And uh, The other one was uh, 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 came in uh, about sunset. I was this was a little more provocative. Uh, it said to uh, two Swatow boats. Now, a Swatow boat is not a torpedo boat. It's a communist patrol boat, uh, incapable of carrying torpedoes, but having a 37 millimeter gun, which is so-so. Uh, it wouldn't hurt a destroyer. A destroyer could defend itself against one of those, but uh, that. Uh, also uh, had a, an H high frequency radio, which the PT boats did not have, but they had the ability to communicate uh, farther than just line of sight distance. They could sit off a couple of hundred miles into radio, the, the uh, leadership of the Navy in Hanoi or Haifa. Uh, I was, uh, I was in the process of talking to my pilots just about the time uh, this message came in, and we were just having a little chew in the fat session. I was still in my flight suit. The uh, ADs started turning up on deck, and I thought, what's going on? This is no flying tonight. It must be an engine check. Boom! I heard one of them take a, 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 a land a, a takeoff uh, on the angle deck. And I went out, and then the door opened, and the, the man told me what we got a message, and it said this. It was a message from the headquarters to the Swatow boats saying, be prepared for operations tonight, and to take PT boat 333 if it can be made ready in time. Well, 333 was the least damaged of the three boats for Sunday afternoon. We didn't know what the target was, and we didn't know any of that. We later found out what it was, and, but I'll tell you that later. But the presumption was of most Americans that they were going to go out and shoot up the Turner Joy and the Maddox. So that became the, the answer to the question, wrong as it was. But anyway, we, uh, he said, I'm going to send your pilots uh, as soon as I get these ADs off. And I had pilots sitting on planes on the catapult, but not turned up yet. Well, I said, I had been out there Sunday shooting at these PT boats. I was going to take advantage of that. I knew how to sink one. 
And I, uh, I went in and got my helmet and my jacket and ran up on deck, and they were already turning planes up, and I grabbed, one of mine was turning up and one hadn't started, and I gave this plane captain and grabbed him, and I said, get up there and tell that pilot to get out that I'm getting in, which uh, happened. And uh, the captain got a little bit upset, but uh, somebody that overheard him said, after he chewed uh, the air about me interfering with the launch, he said, but I think I'd do the same thing as him if I was, his, uh, if I was a squadron commander. And so I got on there, and the plane that had turned up lost his generator on takeoff and had to be landed back aboard. He could fly all right, but he, his electrical system was fouled up. And I asked the captain on the radio if I could go alone. And he said it was only about a, in a F-8 at full cob, it was only uh, 20 or 25 minutes up to where the Maddox and Joy were. And I got up there. I was followed by two A-4s right behind me, Wes McDonald and his wingman. And I had already made up my mind about several things. One is that I knew I'd sort of served in destroyers for nearly three years before I went to flight training. And I knew what, and this was a stormy night, lightning flashes at sea in the Gulf. Uh, high waves, uh, spray. I knew see down there, see what he was doing, the skipper of the ship, and he later confirmed this to me. Uh, I mean, he could see a, a matter of 300 yards ahead of him, say. And uh, I, I, uh, I went down to 1,000 feet. I told them to, uh, that I was approaching, and they, they said they would uh, flash their masthead lights, and they did to confirm there was a turn. Yard. And then I was, and I told Wes to stay above 2,000 feet unless he was going to be in which case to call me because I was going to have my lights out and I was going to be below 1,000 feet. The reason I turned my lights out, I didn't want those ships to get excited when they saw me out there. I could dodge what they were doing. I knew that well enough that I, I wanted to get down and find these torpedo boats. So it was... Uh, uh, only a matter of minutes until the destroyers opened fire, and I went immediately out there to where they had, their shells had hit. We could see the wakes of these uh, destroyers. They were brilliant. They were just like spotting a, in a dark hole, and uh, I could, of course, see the shells, and I was out there with my lights off, spraying the water where these shells had gone in, and I couldn't see any wakes. PT boat wakes are, are much greater and much more visible than destroyer wakes. I'd learned, learned that on Sunday, and I, I just couldn't find anything but black, black water. And uh, so it went. For an hour and a half down there, I could not find anything that resembled Wayne Sunday, and, and, and we should have been easily able to do it. I, even on Sunday in daylight, when, we, when our bullets would hit those PT boat hulls, we'd see flashes. I was shooting right where they'd shot, even if I'd been lucky enough to there was nothing on there. It was just, there was, this, is a, this is a Chinese fire drill, I said to myself. Uh, there was a lot of excitement on the ships. One of them even claimed sinking two ships. Uh, that was on the Joy. And I couldn't make any sense out of that. I, uh, the Con the Constellation launched planes. They, had, they got underway from Hong Kong a couple of days before, after that Sunday raid. And I had a conversation with some of my friends from the Connie. Uh, as I left to go back to the Tycho. Uh, okay, now I uh, went to bed after reading a lot of messages that had come from the Maddox and it, the Commodore had come around at the end of the evening to say to the people in Washington, for God's sakes, we're not at all sure there were any out here, so let's be very careful and not re overreact to what may be just a, 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 a a late night uh, confused situation, words to that effect. So I laughed as I went to bed. It was just after midnight, and I was there lying there in the bed and sound asleep when a, a man started shaking me. And I looked up, and it was an officer. I could see the glint of his uh, collar bar. And uh, I said, what do you want? He said, the captain uh, sent me down here. I'm assistant officer. He just got a message from Washington to uh, strike the uh, mainland of uh, Asia tomorrow. And he wants the number one priority uh, target is uh, VIN oil, uh, uh, POL storage, oil. They had 14 big, giant cylindrical tanks. I'd seen them before as I flew around North Vietnam. Uh, and uh, they were located uh, right in, in part of the town of Vinh, a, a rather large city. 
He said, the captain said, I want you to go down and find Hap Chandler. Hap Chandler was the exe executive officer. He said, Hap's been up for about an hour trying to uh, get the sailors to break out the, the heavy uh, bombs from down below. And you go down and tell Hap what you want. Well, I knew that, uh, I knew by this time, after taking the whole thing to heart, that there would be no air opposition tomorrow because there had been no boats out there and there had been no provocation that they could that they were aware of and, and, and I wanted to have heavy rockets so I could blow those oil tanks up. So I, he said, what do you want on your planes? I said, I want eight Zuni rockets on each airplane and full 20 millimeter ammunition. He said, no sidewinders, no air to air stuff. I said, there will be no air opposition today and God, and he thought I was crazy. I said, we'll get those tanks today and tomorrow there'll be some air opposition perhaps and we'll take sidewinders then. And thus it was. And we went out and we ripped those, uh, we took out 11 of those tanks on the, on the first strike. And those that, the three that remained had big rocket holes punched in them and the oil was spewing out on, uh, into fl patches of flame below. And, uh, and I, uh, I was very delighted with the marksmanship. I had airplanes, I had six F-8s, uh, six A-4s, uh, and a photo F-8. And the big main battery on that trip was the A1s with uh, heavy bombs, heavy, heavy bombs. And they, they were the ones that really, uh, there was flames were shooting to 14,000 feet, I told the ship as we headed home. And uh, uh, the, uh, that, that was a satisfactory climax, and it turned out that that was the climax of the week uh, for, for me. That event that I just named is, in the American official records as the beginning of the Vietnam War, August 5th, 1964. And no, none of our 17 airplanes uh, were hit. Uh, so we landed aboard and those were the three events that you asked me about. I hope I got it out. Mr. Everett, I'd like to ask you a question about your time as the uh, senior officer in the uh, prisoner war camp and, and uh, would you describe or talk about the, the impact that your responsibilities there and the issue of personal example and your leadership in that situation? Yeah. Well, uh, as the, only good way, the only way to lead in the prisoner of war camp is by example because if, if you can't punish anybody, I'm talking about a, a prison system in which uh, People were frequently in solitary confinement, and some of us for years. I and three others were in solitary for four years. You can't get your hands on anybody. You don't, you, and, and the only thing you can do is, is show by your example what we, what I think they should be doing, and to talk to them. We had the code. Uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, this whole thing about uh, RHIP, right? Rank has its privileges. It doesn't have any privileges at all if your job in a prisoner of war camp. You've got your nose to the ground, and when the, when the uh, purge starts, you're the first guy down the chute. And uh, that's the way it should be. Uh, the, the, the senior officers uh, were a little loath to take up the cudgel to the extent of ordering other prisoners into torture by giving them lists of things that they must refuse to do on pain of torture. But uh, I, we did that and we were glad it and the people that were most glad we did it were the, were the people that had their problem solved for them. If you will do this, you know, you usually start saying, uh, things, sweet things when you first take over that uh, kind of uh, prevent you from, from not uh, ch charging them with something that uh, they can't handle. They are begging, they're begging. The good, stout-hearted men are begging for so that they can throw themselves in and go get, carry out the boss's orders. Uh, sounds strange, but that, that's the way it boiled out. And uh, the... Uh, Many, many uh, amplifications of that, but it was, uh, it was a prison that was positively controlled by leaders who were not ashamed to tell, put out a list of things uh, that were not to be complied with uh, 
and it, it, up and and and, and to go ahead and and their their re response would be torture and take it. Uh, sounds harsh, but that's what made the mix last. And uh, we we took care of each other. Uh, if you were really uh, down and out, uh, and you were unable to, uh, to function like you had just been doing, uh, was not uncommon for uh, deals to be made between senior officers that uh, one would uh, take over the other's uh, job until he got well. So it sounds uh, different than maybe most people expect, but this was the way it worked. Sir. General, from the, uh, you've touched on this a little bit, but from the psychological aspect of, of the mindset of the individual and going through torture, the, the fear of, of going into combat, as well as mm -hmm. fear within a, a prisoner situation, isn't it? Uh, you could uh, give us that uh, might would, would help prepare the leaders of today, prepare not only themselves, but uh, those that uh, they're leading. Well, well, we were all, we all suffered fear. We all suffered, uh, uh, home, uh, well, loneliness, uh, but uh, somehow the, uh, I, I don't know how to prepare a person to, to explain it, except to have, tell him to get in there and mix it up and see if it isn't, isn't better than just sitting around and grousing and complying with these absurd orders and and, and, and sitting out the war, as, uh, as, as I said earlier, in, in some cases in Korea. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but uh, I don't, it didn't think, a, a leader, if he's senior and he's, he wants to do the right thing, align yourself with the stout-hearted in the group. Don't try to act as a mediator and and uh, make sure that the timid are not overrun by the we had no nuts in that camp we didn't have any any uh, any getting even with people everybody pretty well was loaded up to their capacity so uh, I I was happy that I never dis that particular element the ones I I, I call the uh, uh, Oh, I can't think of the term, but it was, it meant that the the, the young uh, aggressive people, the uh, young Turks, young I Turks. call them, yeah. that were expert communicators, that were uh, very uh, seductious in their way they could communicate from without being caught, uh, and I uh, that was the group that I tried to keep busy and. And please, and uh, we, we got so that uh, we paid for it. Uh, Fourteen of us, uh, eleven of us, were singled out, and my leadership team, and they were both seniors and uh, and young Turks, and we were exiled from prison. We were uh, bundled up, and uh, I, I, this was a purge that included a trial, for, in which case I was. Uh, before a panel of senior officers, tortured because I wouldn't cooperate. Uh, my leg was partially rebroken at that point. And then after a long time in solitary, we all found ourselves being shipped out of the prison, and the 11 of us, into the Army headquarters area in northern uh, Hanoi, and into a little prison there, which uh, we were told later by the Vietnamese used to be where the top con kept when the French were running the military there and uh, the 11 of us were there for uh, nearly two years uh, we were in leg irons every day and we were in uh, solo but uh, it, we, we really were sort of like the uh, bear rabbit in the, in the cabbage patch we knew each other we were kind of relieved of none of us were going to do anything wrong we knew that so we were no longer uh, uh, we were free of responsibility and uh, we, uh, the eleven of us, and uh, and we had uh, we had lots of fun, talking, and uh, and the leg irons were 
uh, we would, they would be taken off one time during the day when you went to dump your bucket. One of the guys said, I think the time we almost lost was the day we, the, the new guard got our leg irons mixed up. Uh, uh, somehow, I heard this Jim Mulligan's Irish voice uh, yelling over there. He said, G-D-U-S-O-B, these are not my leg irons. I want my leg irons. And of course, the Vietnamese probably didn't understand him. And then the next guy would, hey, what are you doing to these leg irons? Those are not mine. And they're all, the layman wouldn't sense in them, but they're like your shoes. You know when you got your own shoes on. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so finally, everybody went bananas about this thing. And anyway, we, we laughed about it the night he brought that up. That, I don't remember how we got out of that. I think the regular guard had to come back on. But that, everybody was that tense. And, uh, and, you know, I don't have many privileges in here, but having my own leg irons on is a privilege that I expect to have. Now get my leg iron. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's morale for you. Sir. <laughs> Sir, in your writings, you talk about the values of ant uh, things found in antiquities and, and their value to the, the yeah. modern sense. Would you care to? Well, that was uh, kind of one of my, uh, I can't prescribe this to a, uh, the whole crowd. I, uh, I at PG school, I, uh, I, I had taken uh, up the moral philosophy, and, I, 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 and later, when I went back uh, the, after the war, I, I was a, a, a lecturer in the philosophy department at Stanford for a while. But. Um, that really fascinated me, and uh, it, got, it spun around uh, a, a tutor that I had named Phil Rhinelander, who was fascinated with my interest in it, being a, uh, you know, a, a fighter pilot and uh, so forth. And he, uh, he had me psyched out on the last tutorial. He gave me an hour alone with him a week. He said, I want you to take this, uh, this little book with, with you as a memento of our friendship. He said, it's written by a a, a, a Stoic that uh, was uh, born in the first century in Asia Minor and and uh, was uh, sold at auction in Rome and bought by uh, one of uh, the emperors uh, leading uh, and the emperor was Nero and so this guy fought his way out of that I won't give the whole story but he became a, a self-taught philosopher he he would go to lectures in the parks and then. He was exiled to uh, another to uh, Asia Minor again, and uh, or to Greece uh, on the Adriatic, and and I was I was captivated by his philosophy, and uh, and, and then this little book was just a kind of a executive edition of the biggest courses, and from that I can, I that was the perfect philosophy for this prison for me who had studied it, uh, but I wouldn't want to make that uh, requirement for anybody. But uh, if you really want to know how you deal with a situation like we had, Epictetus had as good a solution as anybody does. Admiral, about um, 10 years ago, you, you published an article on, uh, on leadership addressing the uh, the youth of the day in the 1980s and you indicated that um, while some of the students that came to your class uh, obviously came because they agreed with your values and wanted to uh, to see what it was all about but you kind of indicated that there was also another group of youth that indicated that uh, to you uh, while some of the philosophies have changed and the youth have changed over the years that there are still some core areas of, uh, of honor that, uh, that they wanted to hear about. Um, I, I'm just curious, uh, this is now the 90s, the MTV, the Generation X and all that. I wonder if there's anything that you can... Well, you know, I, uh, I saw reference to that yesterday and, uh, and I don't deny anything in it, but I, somebody went and got me a copy. <laughs> and uh, that's 10 years ago. I've written a hell of a lot of essays in the last 10 years. But I, I understand that, and I, I can't emphasize it anymore, but that some people are more uh, uh, comfortable with a vigorous life and a challenged life than others. And, uh, 
and you can turn them around sometimes and not the others. But I, I'm, I've got that in my briefcase. I'm going to read it on the way home. <laughs> See if I still agree with myself. <laughs> Admiral, did, uh, did you notice any significant difference in the kinds of faced in the, in the prison of war camp and the sense of fear and dealing with loneliness and isolation, the kind of fear that you saw and, and experienced in combat, was, were they significantly different things or were they? Yeah, yeah, and I don't know that which was the more scary. I mean, getting killed and burned up in an airplane is a violent end. Uh, what you had to do with there was, there was so much of it was directed, you had to watch out that you didn't, uh, you, you, you thought you were inadequate because you went, went through torture and you gave up more than you should have. Uh, the worst of all is if you've done something to bring harm to another prisoner. That, that, that'll just chill you. You see, after you've been through this and they've given you that 40 minute treatment, including the shutting off of your upper blood circulation uh, and giving you claustrophobia, as well as bashing you around a little bit, but it's the rope bindings and all of this. We've done it time and again, uh, but uh, and you get better at it after a while. But you never beat the ropes. You know you're going to wind up uh, submitting, but that doesn't give you a license to submit early because you got to make them work for it. They, you know, make them hurt you. Uh, but uh, there's then they put you often in what I call cold soap which was being leg irons in an isolated cell, which was, and you'd be in there for about five weeks while you wondered what the guys back where this, this event happened that caused you to be tortured, what was the outcome there? I was kicked out of Alcatraz uh, for starting a riot before the others left. And then I would be tortured back over in Wallow. And I would, I would remember, I said, I hope those guys, how do I know? They didn't get tortured and killed in Alcatraz for what I did. And, you know, so you have all of this emotional baggage and you have to live with it. And you don't have time for that when you're in a dog fight. You're just, it's a Sir. different adrenaline thing. Okay. Admiral, you mentioned earlier that uh, there were times when the senior person perhaps would be, uh, ill or, or sick, I think, were, were the terms you used, and, and someone else would then step in and, yeah. and, and take the lead. And obviously, you, senior person should be taking the lead, but what are some of the ways that you would make the decision that it was somebody else? Well, it, it, it was early in the game, when it was simpler, sometimes I had, uh, my, I was, uh, I had a Naval Academy classmate in there I had total faith in, he, and, and he and me, I think, and uh, Jerry Denton. And uh, I would, uh, on more than one occasion, I've said, Jerry, I'm, I'm spent. Uh, take over for me. And I'll let you know when I'm back up. And uh, he would do that in spades and, uh, and covered for me. And uh, I know uh, that it was that you're, you're, with, you're with, with people you, uh, there's kind of self-selected people get put in the same environment. And this, this group that Jerry and I were always in was, uh, was one in this most stressful, and uh, so uh, that's my example. So, so in your cases, it was a I asked mutual, him. mutual. Okay. Yeah, I asked him, and he did it. He did it, and I would do it for him, and and, and uh, so, uh, guys, we knew. I mean, you know, when we at the bottom of the barrel, you didn't have to wonder how can that guy do this and not be scared to death, and 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 uh, and. and guilt-ridden a lot, you didn't, you knew that he felt like you and he knew, you knew, he knew how you felt and he, you were asking for quarter and he would do that only when he got so far. So there was nothing done that wasn't genuine. You hated to, uh, you hated to disappoint yourself after you've given the lead away, then you say, then I'm losing my guts and you know, then you'd say, no, you're not. You're going to get, everything's in good hands. You're going to get well, uh, settle down. But it's, uh, it's, it's so many times you versus you and your evaluation of yourself. And you can't kid yourself. Sometimes you can do better. And, uh, and you got to bite the bullet and, 
And sometimes you, I've said, what do you know? Sometimes you just have to eat it and chew it. Get it out of, and, and I don't get it out of it, but I mean, well. Now, fear and guilt are my ideas of the real pincers that an extortionist tries to exercise if he wants you to bend to his will. And uh, it's, a, it's a tough pair, fear and guilt, fear and guilt. Uh, all of these uh, accoutrements like the ropes and the iron bars and all those kind of accelerators of this, this real thing. Now, there's no such thing as brainwashing. I, I tell everybody that. Uh, you you know you get lonesome and you wonder when uh, you're going to go crazy and uh, this is the first time you're in isolation for a few months. Nobody's around that you can even shout at, and uh, you think uh, first time in you're oh I'm gonna I won't be able to handle this. You're a month about three or four weeks is for then then it don't. You're stuck with yourself. No such luck. <laughs> Would that I could go crazy, but I've got to. I've got. I've got to live with this guy, me. And uh, so, uh, and then after that, see, he's accommodated that. He knows what to expect in the future. He, if he feels like he's suicidal, uh, he he knows that this will wear off. And uh, that's way self curing. Sir, Admiral, it sounds like you're saying the the real torture was it was a mental issue as opposed to the the physical it, issue and I it was a spiritual it battle. It is a spiritual battle and it, as I say the, you know that the leak and the dike always starts from within and you know that and so you're you have to be tough with yourself. Sure. Admiral, the uh, honor is a, is a strong word it's certainly one of our core values. I, I would be interested in just a little bit of a discussion on when the POWs returned from Vietnam and, uh, and the performance and the, and the were evaluated, what, what did the Navy look at and how was that, how were the actions of our POWs judged? Uh, well, it, we, mon we followed the, uh, the system that uh, we're used to in the services. Most of the aviators in that prison were career men, not all of them, but uh, and and the, the length of time you were in there made, if you were not a career man, you almost became one by association. So they, we expected and got a evaluation. Uh, and a lot of this we did to each other. We evaluated each other as uh, we do by rank and so forth. Uh, the, uh, let's start from the inside and, and say what most of us uh, used as a starting point. Uh, this may sound uh, weird, but in many ways, the, uh, in, in my evaluation, the report card was written by the punishment that the man had been given. You didn't, it, it was not random. When you had a, a man that had two years of solitary confinement, that wasn't the breaks of the game. I mean, they locked him up because they didn't want him around. They didn't want polluting the minds of others. And that is a big plus for us. You might be interested in uh, the breakout of, give you an idea of how long we were in these various, uh, the 15% uh, of the prisoners had a year and not, and, and, solitary. Uh, now we're going to start bringing down the uh, eight percent had, uh, wait a minute, I'm going to get my, I, I got a note here, I don't want to mess, mess this up. Eight percent had two years solitary. Uh, Five percent had three and 1% had four. There were four of us that had, there were about 400 prisoners. When this torture and all this isolation really quit, there was a time when we, at the end where we were, uh, things were happening so fast and the changes and the Vietnamese were sick of us and that uh, things leveled out. It wasn't a happy place, but it was, but it really was uh, most of it done in the first uh, five years, I'll say, starting in 1964. Uh, yeah, 
at the end of 69 or early 70, uh, it was, we were out of the harsh woods. And uh, so four out of about 400 prisoners, and Denton and I and McKnight and Howie Rutledge, I think, were the four. Uh, and uh, so that was, that was a rating system. Uh, most people could be judged on the degree and the number of times. The torture, how many times did they get racked up in those ropes? We well, didn't get quite as analytical and it is not as, doesn't fall out as easily as the solo end. But those are the people that I tried to favor. And why is that? Be does that mean that uh, their intelligence is superior? Not necessarily. Does that mean their, uh, their uh, management skills is superior? That's not quite the word for what I'm giving them those kind of uh, uh, plaudits for either. But it it's a matter of a man that will make them do that to him has got to have a lot of determination. He's doing a lot of it to make life easier for others. He's got He's got an honorable reputation. You just can't go through a process and build up that big numbers in this. It's that, that is really his duty and to try to confront what they're trying to make us do. And what they were trying to make us do early in the war, and I had a talk with the man that was head of propaganda in 1966. I didn't put in for it, but I, and he said, uh, the American people will lose interest in this war when they realize what it's all about. And you prisoners are going to educate them. Thank God it never came to that. But that was their idea. If they could get us to spouting communist law and then videotaping it and getting it into America. So that be suddenly became clear to me what I was there for, and that was to make that not happen. But uh, he, he thought that they could, and uh, uh, it was as though when he got through talking, and this, he was a civilian, a medical doctor from France, who was a friend of the premier, Van Van Dong, uh, but a very good English composer. Uh, he, he was, uh, uh, I figured that he'd just given me the game plan, <laughs> and I didn't know why I got it. And I think I was asked this yesterday, why would he expose himself to that, saying you were going to be the instructors? Never did, of course. But uh, it was because they had no idea of the sophistication of our communication system and its stealth. And it wasn't until uh, the next year that it, they really had a, got a fit. And they found out how powerful it was and how many people were involved. And then they got tougher. And then finally they gave up, really, I think. It was on and on and on. Uh, so we, we uh, when we came, we in the Navy, we were asked to make uh, the subs uh, of what became a, a fitness report of certain people with whom we were familiar, and uh, we had a lot of help. By we were all interrogated at length by uh, uh, intelligence people, and uh, and that and each of us has a document like this that summarizes our our uh, activities and so there was plenty of paper and plenty of uh, things on in print and uh, some of the negatives that people would, would do that we would uh, consider to be uh, failing grades uh, accepting parole uh, that was forbidden by me and others all they were going to give us uh, 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 all they were uh, amnesty they called it uh, they were going to do was to f try to get Americans to compete for f of the favor of going home early. Well, those that went home early got the favor of never being spoken to again. I mean, it was a total cop out. They didn't. They would lead you to believe this was done by the drawing straws or something. They had to make tape recordings that that told the rest of the prisoners that they were uh, had, had had their minds. Uh, changed by the, Vietna the gracious Vietnamese people and sooner or later you will do the same and please make it sooner so we can all go home and forget this war. So those guys were out. Now I'm talking about 12 guys or 14, uh, 400. So there's not many of them but uh, there are others. Now, there, there was, uh, 
we were graded. We had uh, 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 awards, uh, uh, decorations and awards uh, boards. We made recommendations and uh, the services uh, then looked at them and usually agreed pretty closely with what came out of the prisoners' uh, boards. And uh, so, uh, it's the job. And, uh, and uh, I don't think anybody has the feeling that uh, he was ignored totally and never asked about anything when he came home. I, I put on, uh, I remember, uh, I'm, I forget how many hours of tape that would, uh, it was uh, a couple of days of tape recordings that uh, I still have copies of and I can play them. So anyway, we, uh, we went in there and to do a good job and uh, came home and uh, were uh, able to uh, explain what we did. And uh, I think most of us feel that we were, that we were fairly treated and well compensated for this effort we made in behalf of our country. So, hope that says it. Yes, sir, absolutely. And Admiral, I, I, I think I speak for everyone, of anyone who's Honorable leadership or distinguished career certainly exceeds yours. It's, a, it's been a real pleasure and honor for us to have you here today uh, to spend this time with us, uh, your wisdom and your experience. It's uh, certainly clear to me and I'm sure to everyone else uh, why you've always been such an inspirational leader. And we want to thank you for being here with us today. Yes, sir, thank you. Well, I, uh, I you know, uh, I'm here uh, with these gentlemen on a, a visit back to uh, talk to uh, prospective commanding officers. This is in Newport, Rhode Island. and. Uh, Two of these guys are students. They're going out to take over uh, squadron command, uh, destroyer commands, and they're given uh, these weeks here to hear from people like me. And these gentlemen are instructors and uh, uh, experienced leaders, both, uh, as you see by their captain stripes. So, uh, in uh, this is uh, this is a good place, and I'm glad I came back, and I'm glad the Navy is uh, is running such a school now. And I want to thank uh, Mark and, and Mike and Charlie for uh, this uh, friendship. And uh, I consider this uh, one of the high points of my life. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great honor.